for being in back in time, like right after lunch. Uh, my name is Kelly Spear, and I'm going to be talking to you about some um, bat fly microbiomes. So insects with narrow diets have interesting microbiomes. They are predominantly composed of endosymbiotic bacteria that are maternally inherited, encased within a specialized organ in their host. And these endosymbiotic bacteria provision nutrients missing from their host diet. So for blood feeding insects, uh, these endosymbiotic bacteria normally provision B vitamins that are not present in the blood meal and the host cannot manufacture on their own. But the micro microbiome is also composed of facultative bacteria that are not necessarily maternally inherited. These bacteria uh, supplement nutrients not provided by the endosymbionts, or if the endosymbiont loses that functionality through gene loss, uh, facultative bacteria can replace the endosymbiont. Uh, facultative bacteria also contribute to host immune response upon pathogen invasion, and they generally form a more depauperate community compared to omnivorous insects. So insects with narrow diets have depauperate microbiomes compared to insects with diverse diets. While we understand that endosymbionts are maternally inherited, we don't really understand where these facultative bacteria that make up the broader microbiome community come from. And given that they provide these benefits to their host, this could have important implications for our understanding of how selection is acting to conserve the microbiome in insects, and our downstream understanding of how these insects, like blood feeding insects like tsetse flies and mosquitoes, could act as vectors for disease. So one hypothesis is that this broader microbiome community is colonized by a subset of environmental bacteria. Another hypothesis is that the microbiome can be vertically or horizontally transmitted, either directly through the mother or by the population of insects that uh, the individual lives with. So uh, either paternal matern or maternal inoculation. The third hypothesis is that both the environment and insect population can contribute to the microbiome. So to test these hypothesis, hypotheses, I'm going to be using the bat fly bat cave system. So on the left, you have pictures of two different bat fly species, Dracovius frequens and Nycterophilia coxata. These are obligate blood feeding ectoparasites of bats. They parasitize the bat in the middle, which is left to Nycter superquinae. You might be familiar with this bat because it's the tequila bat. It pollinates agave. So if you like tequila, you like this bat. <laughs> um, and these are generally cave roosting bats. So we can take advantage of the hierarchical nature of this system. Bat flies as obligate ectoparasites that are host specialists don't have a limited number of environments that they interact with, and that's dictated by the roost and the bat. So we can more easily take into account the environmental sources of bacterial um, colonization of their microbiomes. So I swabbed the caves, I swabbed the bats that bat flies occur on, and I took the gut and uh, saliva internal microbiome of the bat flies. I tried to dilute the external contaminants by washing the flies before sequencing their microbiomes. And I'm not really gonna talk about my sequencing or processing methodologies. If you're interested in learning more about how I process that data, uh, we can talk later. So I collected from uh, five localities in Mexico, distributed um, in the Baja Peninsula and in the mainland. So two of the localities are very close together on the Baja Peninsula, giving us the opportunity to examine how geographic variation might contribute to variation in the microbiome. So just taking a qualitative look at our results, um, this is just average relative abundance by sample type. So each bar here is a different sample type. The y-axis is relative abundance, and the different colors represent either different classes of bacteria in the case and bat samples, or different genera of bacteria in the bat fly samples. So just generally, we can see that the bat fly samples, which are the four bars on the right, um, are dominated by their primary endosymbionts. Those primary endosymbionts are different between the bat flies, and the bat flies seem to be just qualitatively much different from their bat and cave samples, which uh, don't seem to be dominated by one bacteria. If we split these samples by collection locality, so now all the bars are a different collection locality, the clusters of bars are the sample types, we can see that the cave and bat samples, again, tend to mimic each other across geography. There does seem to be some geographic variation in the cave swaths and the bat swaths but there's very little geographic variation in the bat fly species, which are the bottom plots. Um, and I want to point out the, uh, the presence of these two potential pathogens, which are indicated with the dashed lines or the dark gold lines. Um, so Bartonella is a genus of bacteria that contains potentially important pathogens for bats. 
Uh, this genus also contains some human pathogens, although uh, those weren't detected in this system. Wolvacchia is a facultative bacteria, but it can act as a reproductive parasite of bats, causing mitochondrial DNA sweeps uh, to enhance its own transmission. So these, interestingly, we see these much higher in prevalence in one species of bat fly, but not the other. So let's take a more quantitative view of our data. So when I use principal coordinates analysis to differentiate my microbiome samples, so each of these dots is a different microbiome sample, the colors indicate the sample types, and the shapes indicate the broad region that the samples were collected from, you can see that the colors or the sample types are what is explaining most of the differentiation between the microbiomes. Um, so we see that the both bat fly species are distinct from the environment, and they are distinct from each other. Permanova indicates that this is a significant explanatory variable, but one assumption of Permanova is that you have to have even sample sizes or your categories have to have homogeneity of dispersion, uh, homogeneity of variance. Uh, our data violates that assumption, so this is a common problem for a lot of uh, data sets based on uh, samples collected in nature. So what I did is I uh, used classification using random forests to try and test how robust uh, sample type is at explaining the differentiation we see in the microbiome. Random forests work really well for categorical data. They are a machine learning uh, technique. Uh, they do not make assumptions about the underlying distribution of the data. Uh, they do suffer when sample sizes are uneven between your categories, but we uh, accounted for that by using resampling. So here what I did is I used the variable of interest as the outcome and the microbiome as the predictor for that outcome. So in this instance, sample type is our outcome variable and the pr principal components loading axes uh, or loading vectors are our predictor variables with collection locality. So when we use 80% of our data to fit a model and the remaining 20% to test that model using random forests, we find that the model performs significantly better than the no information rate, which is a model that would just pick the category that has the most samples. So there is a robust signal of sample type in differentiating microbiomes. It does seem that in, uh, the bat fly microbiomes are distinct from their environment and distinct from each other. But remember I showed you this relative abundance plot where the primary endosymbionts of bat flies are contributing most of their microbiome, right? So is this difference driven by the abundance of primary endosymbionts of bat flies? So in silico, I removed the, all the reads that could be mapped to primary endosymbionts, and I reordinated the same samples, just missing these primary endosymbionts. And we still see that the bat and cave samples are very similar, but different from Trichobe spironotus, the samples indicated in black, one of our bat fly species. And our purple samples are right at that intersection between the sample types. Permanova, again, indicates a strong differentiation, but violates our assumption of homogeneity of variance. Uh, when we use random forest, we, do, we are able to fit a model that accurately characterizes the different sample types, but interestingly, um, we are not as good, or it does not perform it as well when differentiating the two bat fly species from each other. So the bat flies are never confused for environmental samples, but they are sometimes confused for each other, which indicates that the bat flies um, might become more homogenous with each other once their endosymbionts are removed. Uh, okay, so what about the effects of Bartonella and Wolbachia, those two potential pathogens that I mentioned earlier? Could those be explaining the remaining variants in the microbiomes between these two bat fly species? Well, when we zoom in on only, let's look only at the samples for Neutrophilia coxata, one of our bat flies, uh, shapes here indicate the different uh, sexes, and the colors indicate the different um, infection statuses with Bartonella, Wolbachia, or no detection of those. Um, pathogens, and uh, we don't see a very strong signal that this is a differentiating factor within Necrophilia coxata. It doesn't seem like infection status is differentiating the microbiomes within this species. When we look at the other bat fly species, Trichobia spironotix, we see a much higher prevalence, which is expected, of um, Wolbachia and Bartonella, but we also see a lot of co-infections that we didn't detect in the other bat fly species. Uh, we don't Based on random forest, we aren't able to differentiate microbiomes within this species using infection status. So, um, kind of uncertain here. Um, but just generally, what we can take away from this is that both the environment and insect population contribute to the microbiome. Um, the evidence for that is that bat fly microbiomes are distinct from each other and from their environment. 
Um, that first plot I showed indicated that sample type was the best predictor, and our random forest did a really good job of identifying or classifying um, microbiomes by their sample type. Uh, environment uh, may also contribute to the microbiome because when we remove primary and disembiomes from the microbiomes, bat fly microbiomes become more homogenous with each other, suggesting that regardless of environment, there is some conserved um, microbiome members within uh, bat flies that potentially we just didn't sample with our cave swaths. So caves are known to have a lot of microclimatic niches that are very narrow, so it's possible that while we were swabbing the caves, we didn't capture those microclimatic niches, and our cave samples are just an average cave microbiome that doesn't show a lot of the variation within a cave. Uh, so these microclimates might actually be driving where bat flies are deciding to deposit their pupa um, or where, uh, where they are meeting with their hosts. Um, we also saw no geographic vari variation detected within bat fly microbiomes in contrast to what we saw with the bats in caves. So this may indicate that um, regardless of where um, a bat fly is, uh, who it's interacting with might contribute more to its microbiome. So we find evidence for both the environment and the insect population contributing to the microbiome. In addition, we found um, potentially different susceptibilities to Bartonella and Wolbachia uh, in between the two bat fly species, which could indicate that microbe-microbe interactions um, are dictating how susceptible one species is to those pathogens. Um, one thing that could be dictating this is priority effects. So the order in which individuals colonize a community, in this case a microbiome community, can dictate their interaction with um, secondary colonizers. So in this case, that would be the pathogens. Um, and we're not certain if this could be governed by the different primary endosymbionts of these species, but it's a, uh, a direction of future work. And I'm a little bit early, but plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Wolbachia is um, it has been found in filaroid nematodes as well, oh, okay. leaving the body cavity of bats. Oh, really? Nobody knows the vector of that. Oh. And I wonder if uh, have you checked for the presence of metasorns in those bat, bat flies? No, I uh, I haven't checked for any the presence of metasorns in bat flies at all. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you have the DNA? I do, yeah. So one thing that we might be able to do, so I didn't show you this data because I just got it back, is um, I did some shotgun sequencing on these samples, so we can actually use that to reconstruct a more complex um, description of the microbiome, not just the bacteria using 16S, but also like the fungi, the metazoans, um, uh, any sort of microbe associated with the bat flies. I guess maybe not viral, but um, yeah, I, maybe we can chat later about that. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, one other thing is uh, bat flies have, some evidence indicates that bat flies might vector Bartonella to the bats as well. Um, maybe gonna hear more about that in, later in the session or, you know, more about Bartonella at least. So, um, yeah, that's a great point. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, so sort of interested in how you're classifying your sequences into bats and mouse units. Oh, yeah, so um, for the principal coordinates analyses, I didn't use any taxonomic definition at all. I just used unique sequences, uh, ASVs, and um, for the relative abundance plots, I used um, the SILVA database to the 99% uh, SILVA database to identify down to genus and class uh, for the cave samples, which were much more diverse. Um, but for my um, quantitative analyses, I didn't use any um, taxonomic information at all, other than the biological, yeah. Thank you.